Hi, I'm Pastor Scott Bailey Kirk here at Platte City United Methodist Church, and thank you for joining us for this time of worship. Uh, I know there are many other things you could be doing and places you might be, uh, and so you've stopped in your busyness of life, perhaps in the quietness of your life, to come and be near God in this time of worship. During the time of worship ahead, you're going to hear music and words spoken and prayers that are offered in a way to help us understand that Jesus truly is the light of our lives. So enjoy this time of worship. Come, let us worship. Oh, how I need you. Oh, how I need you. 
Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Platte City United Methodist Church. Uh, Tom and Jennifer Keller here. Welcome you guys this morning. Uh, we're so glad you guys are getting to join us virtually this Sunday morning as we just keep continuing to worship from homes, from our living rooms, from our bedrooms, from our couches, wherever we are. We're just so glad you guys are joining us. Uh, we're going to go ahead and just open up with a word of prayer so you guys join us real quick. Dearly Father, we are so gracious to be able to still gather in a virtual space, God. It looks different than what we thought it would look like but God but we know that you are ever present in our lives that you are still able to be present amidst this worship God and we are just so thankful it's in your precious name we pray amen all right uh, Jennifer is going to sing this next song uh, what a beautiful name it is Children's Ministry Director here at Platte City United Methodist Church. 
I want to welcome you all to our children's time and invite the kiddos to maybe come a little closer and listen to our story. Scripture tells us everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Today we are going to talk about walking in the light because Jesus brought light into the world. So are you afraid of the dark? It's not unusual for children to be afraid of the dark. Some of you may have a nightlight in your bedroom. You shouldn't be embarrassed. In fact, it might be a wise thing to do. Suppose you wake up in the middle of the night and need a drink of water. If you get up in the dark to go get a drink, you might stub your toe or bump your shin. Ouch, that hurts. If you go for a walk at night, it's a good idea to maybe carry a flashlight or a lantern. Even if you're not afraid of the dark, you might step in a hole or sprain your ankle. A flashlight or a lantern will help you avoid those things that could harm you. If you have the choice of walking in the dark or walking in the light, which would you choose? I know which one I would choose. In the Bible, Jesus talks about light and darkness. Jesus said, light has come into the world. Do you know what the light was that Jesus was talking about? That's right, he was talking about himself. In another place, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You might be surprised to know that some people actually choose to walk in darkness rather than in the light. Can you imagine that? Why would they do that? Jesus tells us, everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their evil deeds will be exposed. Every day, we make choices. If we live by truth, we walk in the light so that it may be plainly seen. As Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So, what choice will you make today? Will you walk in the light or in the darkness? Let us pray. Dear Lord, help us to make the right choices and walk in the light. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's children said, Amen. Well, in the midst of this coronavirus, we really are living our lives so differently, aren't we? I mean, who could have imagined months ago that we would all be sheltered in place the way that we are? We are living our lives so differently. But there is a blessing that I have discovered in this time. It struck me that, that um, the beginning of spring offers so much more daylight than the beginning of winter. And so I'm just, I feel blessed that this virus, when it did hit, hit at the beginning of spring with more daylight than there is darkness, rather than hitting at the beginning of winter when dark would be, the darkness would be long, the long nights and the short days. Um, I like daylight and I don't have anything against darkness. In fact, as a kid growing up here in Missouri, I love to explore caves and I have fond memories of going to this one place in particular, Rockbridge State Park near Columbia, Missouri, and there's a place called Devil's Icebox. And uh, it's still there even today. You can go and you can go down into the cave and go inside. And my friends and I, we would crawl inside the cave and get as far back as we could go. And then we would turn off our lights and we'd sit in the absolute darkness. And it was eerie, but it was fascinating. I really don't have any specific memories of ever fearing the dark. However, I sure do welcome the light in my life. With each beautiful sunset, I always eagerly await the beautiful sunrise and the promise of light throughout the next day. And there's just, there's just nothing like a bright, warm day to brighten up one's spirit, right? We all know that light is critical for life. It's essential. We all need light in our lives. Jesus employed metaphor in reference to himself using I am statements in John's gospel. John is the fourth, got fourth gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And in that gospel, and in the weeks ahead, we're gonna explore some of the significance in our own lives 
when Jesus said, I am. Jesus said, I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. I am the vine. I'm the way and the truth. And this morning, we're going to hear as Jesus refers to himself as light. In John's gospel in chapter 8, we see that Jesus has arrived at the temple. It's early in the morning and he sat down and as other arrived, he began to teach. And while Jesus was teaching, some Pharisees and some scribes approached as they brought Jesus, they brought to Jesus a woman who had been accused of a very serious religious crime. Now, Pharisees and, and scribes, they were uh, people who played a very important role in the Jewish community. It was their, their role, their responsibility to interpret religious law, to know the religious law, and to enforce its rules. So, the scribes and Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery, in infidelity. And they made her stand before Jesus and the crowd gathered there, saying to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, and that'd be religious law, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? Now keep in mind that these men interpreted religious law. They knew the law and they enforced the law. And they knew that the penalty that this woman faced was death by stoning. There wasn't any question about that. So they obviously asked Jesus this question in order to trip him up, to test his reply, in hopes of then charging Jesus with heresy, with blasphemy. And yet Jesus' response was so compelling, so interesting. The story reveals to us that at that moment, Jesus bent down toward the ground, and he began to write on the floor, where presumably it was probably a dirt floor, he began to just draw with his finger on the ground and they continued their questioning and he just kept drawing and impatiently they kept questioning Jesus until at last Jesus stood up he straightened up and then he said to them let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her and then Jesus bent back down and he went back to drawing on the ground and everyone stood there and they thought about his words for a moment and then one by one I imagine if we had been present we would have heard the sound of those stones dropping to the ground one by one the accusers began to leave and when they were gone Jesus stopped drawing on the crowd on the ground and he stood up and he said to the woman woman where are they has no one condemned you and she said, no, sir, no. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. And then there were a few people remaining, and Jesus spoke to those who remained, saying, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. A Pharisee who was within listening distance then said to Jesus, you are testifying on your own behalf. Your testimony is not valid. In other words, the guy was calling Jesus a fake. And Jesus replied, he said, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid because I know where I have come from and where I'm going. But you do not know where I come from and you do not know where I'm going. You judge by human standards. I judge no one. And even if I do judge, my judgment is valid, said Jesus. For I do not alone judge. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. These remarkable words, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. What an extremely intriguing thing that Jesus said in this passage. And what is so remarkable is how Jesus treated this human being, how Jesus treated this very vulnerable woman facing a very dark consequence for her first century actions. And let's be honest with ourselves. I mean, seriously, we all make mistakes, don't we? 
Who among us is perfect? There's not one of us without sin. Now, some of us might admit to having experienced considerable blunders in our lives, and others of us, I don't know, maybe we've experienced quieter indiscretions, but, but like this woman in the story, we have all experienced darkness. Darkness from things that we have done and, and perhaps even been accused of at some point in our lives. Now, I've had uh, people share with me in the past of their dark experiences of people coming at them from all sides, people uh, who were accusing them of things, and perhaps you've had that experience of people gossiping about you, accusing you, saying unkind things to you. Have you ever had anyone take what you said out of context with the intent of making you look bad? Well, welcome to Jesus' world. Yeah. And the remarkable thing about Jesus was his ability to be self-differentiated, to, to be non-anxious in the face of conflict. And when facing dark times, we discovered that Jesus often radiated light. <laughs> that was his nature. That was his divine nature. So, so if your world feels a little bit dark right now, and I think a lot of us are experiencing that either because of a virus or you're not sure of your job or your income or what's going on with school or, or companionship, and you feel very anxious about your life and your world around you, I want you to know this. You are not alone. You're not alone. The American Psychiatric Association, it's called the APA, has done a lot of studies related to anxiety. And studies reveal that we North Americans are very anxious people. Surprise, surprise, right? And some generations feel much more anxious than others. So the most recent survey taken, and this was before the virus came our way, it indicates that two out of three of us are extremely or somewhat anxious about keeping ourselves and our families safe, anxious about paying bills and maintaining our health, by the way, millennials continue to be more anxious than Gen Xers and baby boomers, and baby boomers experience the greatest increase in their anxiety levels. And women reported feeling much more anxious than men. But in the midst of a, a worldwide pandemic where we are all, I mean, every one of us sheltering at home, does this resonate with you right now? Does this uh, kind of reflect how you're experiencing life right now? We are more anxious about our health and about our safety, about our finances, about our relationships, about the political arena. We are much more anxious. And the concern raised by the APA about our increased anxiety level is that increased stress and increased worry can significantly impact many aspects of our lives, including mental health, and it can affect our families as well. And I would even add, it, it affects our spiritual health. And these findings indicate a need for all of us to be proactive and to take steps to reduce the dark negative impact of stress on our lives, especially right now. So I had a conversation with a psychologist, Dr. Michael Kirk, who offers these practical tips for a better life in our very dark and anxious world. So when you feel like things are closing in on you, right? and that people aren't acting the way that you would wish that they would, when things feel uncertain, here's what he suggests. First, come up with one or two things that you can do that are in your control. You might ask yourself, what can I do today to improve my day ahead? Years ago, a guy named Norman Vincent Peale wrote a book called The Power of Positive Thinking, and it works. <laughs> I mean, if you think positively, positive things will happen in your life. So think about a couple of positive things that you can do each day in your life that you have control over in this chaotic world that feels out of control. Think about a few things that you can do that are in your control, and then do those things. Second, and this is an interesting one, if the news outlets agitate you too much, turn it off. Get away from it and take a walk with friends or relax with friends or be with the family out in the yard. Cut off or at least cut back from the source of agitation. Third, do something for someone as a random act of kindness, expecting nothing in return. Most importantly, do something for someone who's in need, right? 
Maybe send somebody some flowers or write a, write a card or, or a letter. Send an email or a text or just really just call a friend and then offer emotional support during this lockdown. Fourth, exercise. Exercise. Get up and move around because when we exercise, it actually circulates what are called endorphins. Endorphins are the things that make us feel good. So it enhances our sense of well-being and it reverses that couch potato syndrome. So walk or get on a treadmill or sit in a chair and rotate your arms and your legs. Breathe deeply and fully, but exercise. And then finally, saving the best for last, pray. My friends, prayer is so important to have that daily quiet time with God. Just talk to God and give God all your worries and your stress and anxieties. Take moments out throughout the day for just quiet times with God, for meditation. I want us to, to realize how Jesus handled stress in his life. You know, in dealing with this woman, Jesus did not add to the woman's stress by accusing her of any wrongdoing or uh, being in the wrong place at the wrong time, or being weak, or giving in a temptation. No. And as we can imagine, she was at a very dark place in her life. She was accused of a religious crime and literally faced a death penalty. And she was low on the social status, so there wasn't a lot of hope for her. And she had every reason to believe that things would not go in her favor. And she was at a very dark place in her life. Until Jesus entered her life. And Jesus brought life. Jesus brought light, right? Jesus offers us these words in Matthew uh, chapter 11, verse 28. He said, come to me, all you that are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I can give you rest. And I will give you rest, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. I think those are really good words for us to hear right now. You see, Jesus invites us into a relationship of love. So if you're at a place in your life right now where your life feels dark and that life is attacking you from, from all sides and you feel like you just need a, a better path in life, I invite you to accept Jesus' invitation to turn to him, to follow Jesus. Confess to Jesus what's burdening in your heart. You can say anything to Jesus. Jesus will reply, I don't condemn you. I do not condemn you. Go on your way. And from now on, just don't do that again. Jesus will not condemn us. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that God sent his son Jesus, and whoever believes in him will not perish, will not be condemned, but experience eternal life. And then John 3, 17 says, Because God did not send Jesus into the world in order to condemn the world. So Jesus will not condemn us. But God sent Jesus in the world in order that the world might be saved through him. Those are words of hope. Those are words of light in the darkness. And so I want us to really think about how is Jesus the light in your life? How does Jesus come into the darkness of your life and become illumined in a way that is transformative and healing and life-giving? Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we just are so appreciative of your enduring presence with us. And sometimes when we ponder the wonders of the world, we, we're just left in awe of its majesty. And we look upon the beauty of a sunrise, and the grandeur of your mountains, and the beauty of sunsets, and we hear the laughter of children and spring emerging all, all around us. We're just aware of the holiness of all creation. Sometimes, God, we also feel lost in this world that surrounds us with all its darkness and trials and tribulations, with, with pandemics and, and anger and people who just feel so lost and people who fight with one another and can't get along and we get lost in the crowds and the mass of humanity. Sometimes we just feel, God, that our problems and struggles are insignificant when measured against everything that's going on in the world with human tragedy. But God, we turn to you. And we know that we need the assurance of your presence in our lives. We know, God, that we can trust you to care for us. And so, so on this day, at this moment, we offer ourselves to you. 
hold us, God, and encourage us for new potential, new possibilities, new promises. Nurture us, God, just as you would nurture the fertile seed that emerges in the springtime. And grant us patience to wait, God, for the new thing that you bring into our lives. So touch us where we are, where there's grief and uncertainty and sorrow. God, just grant us your comfort. And where there's illness and hurt, God, we just ask for healing in our lives. And where there is indifference and anger, God, peace and reconciliation is our prayer. And where people fear and have despair, grant us confidence, the ability to face the future. God, in the darkness of our lives, we know that Jesus is the light. So God, may we always open our hearts, open our spirits, enable us to live as resurrection people who see the light and embrace it. Transform us from frightened, hesitant, uncommitted followers to people who are able to give meaning and hope to others because we know that the light that Jesus offers is life-giving and eternal. And it's in his holy name we pray and all of God's people say, Amen. And now, friends, let's continue our time of worship with music. Thank you for joining in this time of worship with us. My thanks to Tom and Michelle for their awesome leadership. To Steve, who each week uh, takes all the elements of worship and weaves them into the tapestry of what we experience in this time. May you be blessed as you go forward into this world, this uncertain, dark world. And remember five things that we can do to make a difference in our lives each day. One, you can come up with one or two positive things that are in your control that you can do each day. And second, if there are things that you're exposed to by watching or reading or hearing that agitate you, back off from those things and do something enjoyable. 
Third, do something as a random act of kindness for another person, especially someone in need. And right now as a church, as a congregation, we're exploring how we can reach out to our neighbors, to our friends, to our families in the area and offer what we can offer. And we'll be sharing more information with you about that very soon. Fourth would be to get up and move around to exercise. If you feel like you're just kind of being lazy right now because you're home all the time, get up and move around. It enhances our sense of well-being when we get the body going. And then finally, last but certainly not least, pray. Turn to God in a time of prayer and offering up your worries, your anxieties, and giving them over to God, knowing that God sends to us the light of Jesus Christ that transforms, renews, restores, heals, and loves us no matter what. So my friends, as you go out into this world, as the world begins to open up a little bit more each day, go with the love of Christ and go with the grace of God and go with the power and the communion of God's Holy Spirit until we gather for worship again. Peace. Will you guys join us as we close with May You Run and Not Be Weary? May you run and not be weary, may your heart be filled with soul, and may the love of God continue to give you hope and keep you strong, and may you run and not be weary, may your life be filled with joy. Thank mm-hmm. you.